Okay, thanks very much. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about improving transparency and reproducibility through data visualization. Um, and I will present one topic, which is why you shouldn't use bar graphs to use continuous data and what to use instead. And then we'll have some time for discussion afterwards in which we may touch on other topics, depending on how things go. Um, so I'll start off talking a little bit about why figures and visualizations are so important, after which I'll talk about <clears throat> the problem with bar graphs of continuous data and how to replace them with more informative graphics. And then we'll go into questions and discussion. So one of the things that I think it's important to remember about figures um, is that data presentation is important because it's really the foundation of our collective scientific knowledge. So when we think about manuscripts, it's very common for us to use the figures to show the most important data points that outline the key messages of the paper. Um, figures are really critically important because they're often showing our data for key findings. And beyond that, the underlying data for those findings are rarely available. So usually all that we know and all that we will ever know about the data contained in that paper is in the figures and sometimes the tables. And this is a really critically important point because if we are consistently making errors in the types of figures that we use or we're using graphics that are uninformative or conceal the data, then we are hiding information um, and that information is lost for all of the future. And no one wants to be responsible for ruining the future. So we're going to talk a little bit today about problems with one of the most common visualizations used in the basic biomedical and biological sciences. Our work for does focuses quite a bit on small sample size data sets. Um, so typically samples, fields where sample sizes are often less than 15 independent observations per group. And in the era of big data, I think it's worth spending just a minute talking about why these small sample size data sets are so important. The first thing is to emphasize is that they are extremely common in basic biomedical and biological sciences, as well as in translational science. So for example, if you look at preclinical research on cardiovascular disease and stroke, the average sample size is eight animals per group. The next reason that these small data sets are important is they influence decisions about what potential treatments advanced clinical trials and future research. So we know that the clinical trial process is very expensive. It places a lot of burdens on our patients and it exposes them to risks and it uses a lot of resources. And that means that it's very important that we have the best information possible on which to make a decision about what agents should go forward into clinical trials and what agents should not. And because of that, um, visualizations are one way of communicating that information, so they're quite important. The last thing to note is that um, from the US perspective, when the National Institute of, uh, Institutes of Health, which is our main biomedical funder, when they're talking about problems with reproducibility, they are especially focused on preclinical research. So clinical trials have gone and undergone a number of changes in recent decades to reduce problems um, and to make things more transparent and reproducible. And these include things like requiring pre-registration to prevent outcoming switching, um, requiring blind, blinding and randomization and other sorts of measures, whereas these types of measures are still relatively uncommon in the preclinical arena. So what should effective visualizations do? Well, effective figures should really do four things. The first thing that they should do is immediately convey information about the study design. So when I look at your figure, I should immediately have a sense of whether this is a cross-sectional or experimental study where you're comparing groups, whether it's a longitudinal study where you're measuring the per same participants or animals over a, a period of time at different time points, or whether it's potentially a study where you have matched or paired observations. The second thing that the visualization should do is allow readers to confirm that the statistical analysis is appropriate for the study design. The third thing and the thing that most of us focuses on is that a visualization should illustrate the most important findings of a paper. And then the last thing is that a visualization should allow the reader to critically evaluate the data. And it's this last point where the types of figures that we most commonly use run into problems. So um, one of the things that I think it's important to emphasize is my interest in this area is not simply abstract. It comes from my own research into the pregnancy complication preeclampsia. 
So with preeclampsia, um, women end up with a similar set of symptoms. However, they get there in many different ways. Some women have maternal risk factors, other women have problems with the fetus and the placenta, and they may have multiple, many women have problems with all of those things, and they may have multiple different pathophysiological pathways that are contributing to disease in each of those categories. And so the field of preeclampsia right now is really thinking about how can we identify subgroups of patients with unique pathophysiologies so that we can target treatments to their pathophysiologies. And this is something that comes up in many other fields as well. Data presentation is really important here. If we want to identify subgroups, we can't use a bar graph because there are no subgroups in a bar graph. Bar graphs are what we want to use when we want to mask heterogeneity, when we want to understand it, we need more informative figures. So in order to address this issue, we published this paper in PLAS Biology in 2015. Um, and this paper was viewed more than 100,000 times in the first month that it was published. And it has since gone on to be cited and contribute to policy changes for a number of journals encouraging authors to use more of continuous data. And some of the early journals that adopted changes were journals like PLOS Biology, eLife, and the Journal of Biological Chemistry. We also know that many editors and reviewers use the paper when in requesting that authors improve their visualizations during the revision process. And the paper was also instrumental in starting the Bar Bar Plots Kickstarter campaign, which targeted neuroscience journal editors and encouraged them to implement policy changes. So what did we do? Well, in this paper, we looked at 703 papers published in the top 25% of, of physiology journals during a three month period, because that's what transatlantic flight and, and jet lag are for. And we found several things. The first thing we found was that almost all papers were using bar or line graphs to present continuous data. So 85% of figures or papers had a bar graph of continuous data, 61% had a line graph. When it comes to more informative visualizations that provide you with more information about the data distribution and the sample size, those weren't used very often. So only 13% of papers had a dot plot and 5 to 8% had a box plot or a histogram. We also found that sample sizes were very small, in most cases less than 10 independent observations per group. We found that most of the time the bar graphs were showing standard error and they were being used to tell us about the precision of the mean and not the variability in the data. And finally, we found that more than half of papers that were using non-parametric analyses for their continuous data were presenting data that had been analyzed non-parametrically as a mean and standard error or mean and standard deviation. And this is a problem because the non-parametric analyses are typically something that we use when either we know the data distribution is not normal and hence a mean and standard error or standard deviation are likely to be misleading, or when the, data, when the sample size is too small to determine the data distribution. So you might be wondering, that was five years ago, have we solved the problem yet? Journals have been implementing policy changes which sound good, so is this fixed and why are we still talking about it? Well, in order to address this question, we did a follow-up study that was published late last year where we looked at original research papers published in the top 25% of peripheral vascular disease journals. And what we found was that bar graphs of continuous data are the most common type of data figure period. Nothing else is really even coming close. Um, and that also means that they are the most common visualization problem. And so in terms of fixing visualization errors, this is still where we need to spend our time. So you might be wondering, why shouldn't I use a bar graph to present continuous data? Lots of people do it. I see it all the time in my papers that I'm reading. Um, if this is such a problematic practice, then why is everyone doing it? Well, there are lots of reasons why it's not a good idea to use bar graphs for continuous data, but I'll talk about a couple of them. And here's the most important one. Many different data distributions can lead to the same bar graph, and the actual data may suggest different conclusions from the summary statistics alone. So here you can see a bar graph on the left of your screen and then four different data distributions that will give you that same bar graph on the right. And the first thing I can see from looking at these graphs are these are very small sample sizes. So there's a lot of uncertainty here and I shouldn't be too confident in the findings from any of these studies. However, if I were to go ahead and look at the actual data, 
in the panel B, I would see that the observations for group two are just a little bit higher than those for group one, and this might be a difference that I'm interested in pursuing. In the next figure, the higher values in group two seem to be partially driven by an outlier. Um, and so perhaps it's less likely that this is a finding that I would be interested in exploring. In the next panel, we have something interesting going on. It looks like there could possibly be two different subgroups and we may have a bimodal distribution. Now our sample size is much too small to make that determination, so we can't be sure. However, if we had a larger sample size and we were seeing the same pattern, then we would want to know whether there's some other factor that might explain these two clusters of observations. For example, is it the case that women consistently have higher values than men and therefore sex is a variable that we need to account for in our analysis? And then in the last case, we can see that the observations for the second group are clustered at the high end of the observations for the first group. However, the sample size for that second group is also very small, and it's likely that we've underestimated the variability. So we'd want a larger sample size before drawing any conclusions. Importantly, it's also important to note at the bottom that we can't distinguish between these scenarios based on p-values alone. So there's really no substitute for seeing the actual data. The next question that I get is, okay, let's say I know my data are normally distributed. Can I use a bar graph then? And the answer to this question is still no. Um, and this figure illustrates why. The first reason is that bar graphs don't allow you to critically evaluate the data, which is one of the four important points about why we're doing visualizations in the first place. But the second problem is that bar graphs really distort our perception of the range of observed values. So they arbitrarily assign importance to the height of the bar, rather than focusing our attention on the important thing, which is how much overlap there is between groups or how the difference in means compares to the variability in the data. So what very often happens with bar graphs is we start with a y-axis minimum of zero. And sometimes that's okay because the values around zero are physiologically or biologically possible and meaningful and will occur in your data set. In other cases, there are no values around zero, um, and these aren't physiologically or biologically possible numbers. And so you can end up dedicating a large portion of your graph to what's called the zone of irrelevance, um, where there are no data points and there will never be any data points. The other challenge we have is that when we make bar graphs, we very often cut off the y-axis a little bit above the error bar for the highest group. And when we do that, we can end up cutting off values that were actually observed in our data set, but are higher than the highest error bar. And this is called the zone of invisibility. So again, the bar graph is really distorting our perception of the range of observed values. So what I want you to remember here is that our interpretation depends on what we see. So when I look at the bar graph shown on the left, um, I'm looking at means and standard errors, and there's really no information for me to critique here. I don't know how big the sample size is. Um, I can look at the bars and I can say, okay, maybe the second group is a little bit higher than the others, hard to tell. Um, I'm essentially just taking the author's word for what they found, and I don't have the opportunity to verify that for myself. In contrast, when we show a dot plot or another more informative graphic of the same data, the reader becomes an active participant. So now I can see that the sample sizes are small across the board. There's a lot of uncertainty here. There may be an outlier in the third group. Um, the sample size in the small group that is, has the highest values is even smaller than the other groups and um, perhaps more uncertain. And maybe there's a bimodal distribution in the first group, maybe not, the sample size is too small to really determine that. So all data presentation methods are a reflection of reality. Looking at your data in a bar or a line graph is a little bit like looking at a reflection of a duck in a wavy pond. You hypothesize that you were gonna see a duck and you see something that looks duck-like, so you're excited and you think you found what you were looking for. But the problem is your image is distorted and so you can't really tell. So no one wants to waste lots of time and energy and resources in pursuing something that they think is a duck only to find out later that it's actually an oddly shaped potato. And hence it's important to select methods that minimize distortion when you're creating your figures. So you might be wondering, okay, so if I'm not gonna use a bar graph, what should I use instead? 
Well, this is going to be a big and very complex slide. Um, I'm presenting this just so you know that it exists. You can find a full version of this as a helpful resource for when you're making your graphs in our circulation paper with the, at the DOI below. Essentially, this is going to depend primarily on the sample size, um, a little bit on the data distribution. So if you have a very small or a small sample size, you will use a dot plot. And the reason for this, reason for this is that summary statistics are only meaningful when you have enough data to summarize. So very small or small sample size, dot plot. Um, you can use them with any data distribution. Some people like to use them for slightly larger samples as well. As your samples get a little bit larger, you will start to have more confidence in the summary statistics shown in other types of figures. And so you can create a combination graph. And you can, for example, as shown here, perhaps combine a dot plot with a box plot or a violin plot. Um, this you're going to use with medium sample size, and you can do this for any data distribution. At some point, your sample size is going to get large enough that showing the individual dots will just create a giant mess. You'll have a lot of overlapping dots. It will be very confusing and hard to see what's going on. And at that point, you can be confident in the summary statistics. And so it's okay to simply show those either as a box plot or as a violin plot. The one important factor when you're choosing between these is if your data appear bimodal or multimodal, you should not use a box plot. And the reason for that is you won't be able to see the separate peaks in your data distribution. So if your sample size is large and your distribution is not bimodal, you can choose between box or violin. If your distribution is bi bimodal, then you should use a violin plot. Last question, the bar graph. Bar graphs are designed for counts or proportions, so situations where the bar is literally filled with data and the bar height shows the value of the counts or proportions. Um, in these situations, you should definitely use a bar graph. However, I would encourage you to move bar graphs to your dead to me list when you're working with continuous data. Okay, so some people will say, well, I still prefer bar graphs because they convey a clear message. Sometimes it's hard to see what's going on with dot plots. The good news is this is a false choice. Um, very often you can have a clear graphic that conveys a clear message and also allow readers to critically evaluate your data. And you do that in two steps. The first step is to make all of the points visible. And so there's a series of steps that you can go through to do this, but basically it's best just to go to the option E on the left, which is symmetrically jittering your points around the center line. And that allows readers to see all points and to trace the outline of the data distribution with their eye. The next thing you're going to do is using something called emphasis and de-emphasis. So we emphasize the summary statistics by making the line for the median black and placing it in the foreground. And then we de-emphasize the data points by placing them in the background and making them gray. So when I look at this figure, the first thing that my eye will see is the medians or the change in central tendency. And I will note that the third group appears to be a bit higher than the other groups. But then I still have the option to take a second look and critically evaluate the data to look at the sample size, the distributions, and other things that I might be interested in. So you can have both. You don't have to choose between either having a cleared message or having an informative graphic. Another common practice and question is, can't I just add some dot plots to my bar graph? If I just put the dots on, are we okay? And the answer to that question is, technically, I would prefer a bar graph with dots to a bar graph without dots any day. However, a dot plot is never, or a bar graph with points is never going to be as clear and informative as a dot plot. And there are four reasons for this. Um, the first reason is that we very often shade our bars, which obscures the data points and makes them hard to see for the points inside the bar. The second is the bars and the vertical lines are chart junk. So they don't really add any information beyond what I would get from a mean or median line. And in fact, the solid cre shape creates the illusion of certainty without adding any information. So that salt line or that bar is just as solid whether I have two observations or 2000 observations. And those are vastly different scenarios in terms of how confident I would be in what this data is showing. 
The next thing, if your data set has a zone of irrelevance, then that's going to falsely alter readers' perception of the size of the difference, as we talked about before. And the last thing is a problem called within the bar bias. And this is a perceptual problem. So when readers see a bar graph, they incorrectly believe that the points are more likely to fall within the bar than above the bar. And this creates a problem because it further distorts our perception of the range of observed values. In contrast to the dot, this the dot plot provides everything you need and nothing that you don't need. So it makes it much easier to see the magnitude of the difference and the overlap between groups. And the features that affect our interpretation are all clearly visible. You might be wondering if I need if you need expensive software to make all these figures and you do not. There are lots of free resources available online as well as tools. Um, the table three in our circulation paper has a list of some of the online tools that are freely available that you can use to make these types of graphs. The next question I often get is, does it matter how I did my statistical analysis? And it absolutely does. So if you remember at the beginning, we talked about how the, reader, the figure structure should tell the reader about your experimental design. Um, and this is a common source of problems when authors are creating figures. So if your figure structure does not match with your experimental design, then you end up sending mixed messages, which is confusing to reviewers and readers. So let's take an example where I want to compare two different types of mice. And let's say I have three different biomarkers, um, which are just three different dependent variables that I measured. And I use t-test to compare values for each dependent variable. So I'm interested in comparing mice. I don't care about comparing the biomarkers. What readers or what authors will often do is they will put all three biomarkers on the same graph, even though they're not interested in comparing them. And this creates problems because now as a reader, I want to know why you haven't compared the biomarkers when they're on the same graph and why you're simply using t-tests to compare the different types of mice. So how do we fix this? We use a figure structure that matches our study and design. So we use separate panels for each of our biomarkers to make it clear that we're interested in comparing mice, not biomarkers. Um, how do you design figures that match your study design and statistical analysis? Well, for those of you who are working with simple analyses of smaller data sets, it's often best to show one graph per analysis, and the graph should include all groups, time points, or conditions from the analysis as they were analyzed. Um, and we have visual examples of how to do this for different scenarios in the circulation paper. This is a reminder. So in order to confirm that your analysis is appropriate for the structure of your data, the reader needs to know exactly what type of analysis you performed. And very common in the basic biomedical and biological sciences, you'll see a stat section that's approximately two sentences long, and it will say something like data were analyzed by t-tests or ANOVA as appropriate. Statistical significance was determined at p less than 0.05. Um, and this is a problematic practice because there are many different types of t-tests or ANOVA, some of which will be appropriate for your study design and some of which will not be. And so readers really need to know which type of t-tests or ANOVA they can use, you use before they can make a decision about whether that matches your study design. Um, so this paper deals rather extensively with the type of problems that people have in their statistical reporting, and there are a lot. In many cases, it's really not possible to determine what type of t-tests or ANOVA the authors were using. We don't have information to verify the test result, like the exact p-value, the test statistic, and the degrees of freedom. And there are also signs that authors are consistently choosing a type of t-test or ANOVA that's not appropriate for their study design. So if you'd like to learn more, um, I do have a very fast visual overview on my Twitter account that just provides visual answers to the questions that I went through today, as well as many others and links to resources for each of those things. And then there's a webinar of a more extended version of this talk that's also freely available. Um, since I'm talking to everyone today, I just thought I would mention that we did post a new preprint late last week. 
So for those of you who are working with image-based figures, whether it's microscopy, photographs, electron microscopy, or clinical imaging techniques, this paper addresses some of, we did a meta-research study to identify the most common problems and how common they were. Um, and we also provide a lot of very clear visual examples about best versus not so good practices that we frequently saw. So the preprint has some information about how to design figures, including a template for a figure planning table, um, information on strategies for making image-based figures transparent and easy to understand, and providing essential information for reproducibility, as well as teaching slides with many visual examples. Lastly, um, the work that you're seeing comes out of meta-research studies done by a lot of people, including my colleagues at Mayo Clinic and at the University of Belgrade Medical School, um, as well as the eLife ambassadors that contributed to the imaging study that I just mentioned. So I would like to thank all of those people as well as funders. And at this point, I'm happy to welcome questions, comments, and emotional outbursts. Wow, well, that was all really right. Okay. Oh, sorry. Victoria, was that? Oh, no, sorry. I was just no, saying no. that was. Please, sorry. I, I had an emotional outburst. Yeah, <laughs> everyone. <laughs> Me oh, too. <laughs> I, I Thank should you. specify all emotional outbursts shall be uh, directed at Julian. He's the designated recipient for emotional outbursts today. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So okay, thank you very much, Tracy. So I think that we can open the question now. Everybody can write in the chat uh, or either open the micro. So we have a question in the uh, open data uh, text pad that finally gets used by others. I'm uh, happy about that. Emotional okay. first. The question is, do you have any suggestions for longitudinal data that are often visualized with line plots? Um, yeah, we get this a lot. It, so a lot depends here on your sample size. I have suggestions for smaller samples. Larger samples are complicated. Um, so we talked about this in a PLOS biology paper that we published in maybe 2016. Um, it's called, it's the one on that introduces the interactive line graph tool. Um, so I will post a link to that in my Twitter account later, but if you go to the supplement of that paper, it will review options like small multiples, spaghetti plots, um, selecting a few observations to show and showing to show longitudinal trends and then showing the lines for everything else. And it'll provide you an overview of the advantages and disadvantages of those various different techniques. Okay, that's great. So um, Timon has asked in the chat a question which probably many people are uh, keen, like uh, which packages do you find most accessible for uh, your data analysis and uh, what are you using? And um, maybe I can hop on this and post a and directly add a second question. Did you ever try to approach the large um, companies providing such tools to uh, move away from bar plots. So, for example, MATLAB is a, is a common uh, environment where many people visualize their data, and I think there isn't a good dot plot option. So, maybe it would even make sense to like talk to them. Um, yeah, so I have talked to, I was at a conference in 2017 where I talked to Harvey Motleski, who is the creator of GraphPad Prism, um, and he was adding violin plots as a result of the talk that I gave at that conference. Um, I did talk to someone from MATLAB. I'm not a MATLAB user. Um, so, but yeah, I think it's really important to, if you have a package that you like, talk to people and say, how do I do this in your package? You know, give me something, give me whatever you can. And if it's not possible, how can you make it possible? So um, you for yourself are using GraphPad or R or what are you using? Um, I very often, sometimes, so I was trained back in the day when in, in the basic bio biomedical sciences where everyone still uses Excel. Um, I don't encourage that, but there are a lot of basic scientists that do that. Um, we have created a, our, like a flip book 
that describes everything in our, how to do everything in our visual Q&A and R. Um, so my student finished it two months ago and I have not posted it. So that's on me. Um, so for those of you who are looking for R codes for all of the things that I just described, we have them. I just need to get it out. And if you can motivate me by emailing me and telling me you're looking for that, that would probably help. Um, Python, I don't use it all and I have never used, but again, if someone wants to create a similar visual tutorial for how to do the things described in our Q&A or other types of visualizations in Python or another package, I think those things would be really helpful. To me, when I teach visualization, I use a conceptual focus, so I spend a lot of time talking about what makes a good visualization. Because I think if you know that, then you can go back and figure out how to do it in whatever program you're most comfortable with. Whereas if I spend a lot of time te you know, teaching you to code, that doesn't help if you don't know how to make a good visualization um, and if the conceptual side is missing. So yeah, my, I focus a lot on teaching concepts as opposed to the coding. And I assume that you will be able to go back to whatever package you're comfortable with and figure out how to do it, and if not, figure out you know, who you need to talk to or what other options you might have. Um, the one thing I will say for dot plots, and I don't think I have slides for this in this particular slide set, but um, if you go to the visual Q&A, there is a slide on how to tell whether your software package is making a true dot plot or a histogram with dots. So some packages make true dot plots in the sense that they will plot every data point exactly where its measure value was. Other packages will make a histogram with dots. So they'll, they will create a certain number of bins and then they will move all of the points in the bin to the center of that bin. And so you get these very nice regularly spaced intervals in your dot plot. Um, this is not great. It's not a dot plot. It's a histogram with dots. It should be labeled as such. So I would encourage you to test your package and make sure that it's creating a dot plot before you use it. And if it's not, find something else. And you just need to put in some irregularly spaced data. And if it comes back irregularly spaced, you have a problem. For our users, geom jitter um, and geom point, I believe are histograms with dots. They are not dot plots. So that's something to be aware of. Okay. That's great. I, uh, I actually, for I think many people are asking about resources and tools, and I uh, copied the links that uh, Tracy included in table three of her circulation paper and posted it to our open pad. You can have a look there. And um, I see that Saeed Salehi is also uh, suggesting a nice implementation for Python. And I'm going to copy that link also to our pad to make it available to everyone. Any other questions unrelated to maybe the direct implementation, more conceptual ones? I think from my side, uh, I already mentioned previously that we often use, uh, uh, look at multidimensional data and statistics, and there is a new challenge similar to line plots, but even more challenging. Um, also, heat maps are something that are very commonly used. So, um, I am personally not a big fan of parametric statistics in general. So I, whenever I can, I try to use permutation because of the uh, uh, lack of reliance on a certain distribution. But if you uh, use parametric statistics, which measures would you additionally visualize in the dimensions that you do visualize? So uh, would you always prefer the standard error or the standard deviation? Obviously, it's probably standard deviation, but like yeah. what, what could other things be that you would recommend to visualize? Um, we have the standard error, standard deviation. And I have that, I get that question a lot from editors. Um, my, my answer to it always is, first of all, this is something that people have been fighting about forever. Um, in practical terms, they mean conceptually different things. I have been in a room, so Harvey Multuski in one of his papers has a really good figure where he shows the same distribution or the same data set as a dot plot, a box plot, um, mean with 95% confidence intervals, mean with standard deviation, mean with standard error. Um, and I have been in a room where that was presented at a basic sciences conference and people just gasp because they think they don't understand what the standard error means. Um, they just know that they like it because the error bars are smaller. 
Um, <laughs> and it makes the difference between the group looks bigger and they assume that if there's no overlap in the standard error, there's no overlap between the groups, which is not true at all. Um, and so because of that issue, I am very firmly in the standard deviation camp, but I am also in the camp of if you show a dot plot, it frankly doesn't matter. Um, because you can, you have everything you need to see the points and how much they overlap. And a lot of times sample sizes are so small that the summary statistics aren't going to be meaningful. Yeah, and the thing is that if you have a multidimensional data set, you can uh, visualize the one point, which is the standard deviation and not the dots associated with that, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Or even confidence intervals or like any single additional measure or maybe multiple even uh, that we could easily visualize. So it doesn't matter for me from an implementation point of view, whether mm -hmm. I um, visualize the median, the mean, the standard deviation or the uh, confidence interval. It's just a question like what is the most robust and effective one? Yeah, and I don't work with multi-dimensional data, so I'm going to pass on answering that question. Um, what I am going to do, since you have mentioned the point of lasagna plots, um, is I am going to talk a little bit about color maps. Ah, that is a great point. Before you move on with that, yeah. could I uh, quickly just ask one more simple question from Toivo? Uh, that is, um, how would you recommend plotting individual effects of a multiple regression? model. Do you have any comments on that? Um, no. You don't I'm... have individual and observations anymore. Is, there, is that something that you have um, worked with or do you want to pass on that? Yeah, I'm going to pass on that as well. Okay. I'm, I'm a, I was trained as a basic biomedical scientist, so I work with the statisticians to make sure that the stats in our paper are appropriately presented um, okay. and have a good educational content, but I refuse to answer certain direct statistical questions. That I okay, but it shows uh, that there's a lot of space for further development. Well, and I think this is one of the um, advantages. If once you get people to start visualizing their data, they automatically start to think about the statistics more, um, which can really help with the basic sciences where people tend to be afraid of the statistics. So it can be a very good entryway into statistical topics. Yeah. Okay. So color maps. Um, Julian mentioned lasagna plots. Pretty often those are in red and green. Um, this is a problem. And it's, it's a problem largely because of colorblindness issues. So I'm going to talk a little bit about colorblindness and some ways that you can make your figure accessible to colorblind readers. Um, so many of you will be familiar with the jet or rainbow color map as shown here, it's one of the most commonly used color maps in scientific paper, in the news media, everywhere. People are very familiar with this color map and they like it a lot. It's also used a lot for imaging technologies, for example, for Doppler flow imaging and other types of things. So the problem with these color maps is that they can create contrast where none exists. So here you see the same picture, the Mona Lisa, um, and presented in a jet color map and then a Viridis color map. And the Viridis color map is colorblind safe and it's also what's called perceptually uniform, which means that our eyes react to the same colors or to the colors in the color map in a rather linear fashion. In contrast to the jet color map, it's not colorblind safe. It's also not perceptually uniform. And that means even if you have normal color vision, your eye is going to react much, much, much more strongly to the red and orange colors than it does to the other colors. And that means that this color map creates visual artifacts or contrasts where none exist, which means you interpret your data incorrectly. So for example, if I look at the picture of the Mona Lisa, either the normal one or the Viridis color map, I might say, okay, you know, there's lightness around her chest and maybe in her face, um, but nothing crazy. Whereas when I look at the jet color map, I think, oh my God, what's going on there? That's insane. We definitely need to look at that. Um, and I would be wrong because it's an artifact of the color map that was used. So don't use jet color maps or rainbow color maps. Replace them with colorblind safe alternatives. There are others, you can Google them. Um, and okay, so choosing colorblind accessible colors. Why? Well, the reason this is important is that the most common form of colorblindness affects up to 8% of men and half a percent of women of Northern European ancestry. And I'm not sure if you guys are aware of this or not, but apparently I've heard that there are a lot of 
men of Northern European industry um, in science. And so if you think about it, it's very likely that by the time your manuscript goes through all of your co-authors and reviewers and editors in order to get published, particularly if you're submitting to more than one journal, at least one of those people is going to be colorblind. And then when you put it out into the actual universe, someone is definitely going to be colorblind reading your paper and probably lots of people. So it is to your advantage to make your figures in a way that those people can also understand and interpret your data. So you might be thinking, I am not colorblind. How do I know whether my finger is colorblind accessible? Um, you can use free tools to simulate what a colorblind person would see. They're not 100%. Every person is a little bit different, but the tools will give you a broad idea of common problems. And the tool that I use is called Color Oracle. You can go to the website and download it in the time that it will take me to present this slide. Um, when you download it, you will see a little color wheel and you'll be able to click on options for that will basically just change your screen to one of the three different forms of colorblindness, depending on what you select. So here I have a picture of, as seen with normal color vision, of a little lizard thing on a plant. And if I were to look at this with the most common form of colorblindness, I would see that the lizard and plant are now completely the same color. And so if you are using red and green lasagna plots or heat maps, this is what's happening. A colorblind reader has no idea what's going on. They cannot tell the difference at all. So your visualization is completely useless to them. Whereas with tritinopia, the green goes to a little bit more gray. I can still distinguish between these two. And this is the least common form of colorblindness. So what colorblind accession or um, options or what color combination should you use? Well, I'm showing a variety of examples here. So this is see, as seen with normal vision, most common form of colorblindness, and then in the third column, the least common form of colorblindness. Um, green and red, really common color combination. Deuteranopia, the most common form of colorblindness, no idea, no ability to discriminate between these two, not good. Whereas with tridinopia, I can still tell the difference. The next combination is green and blue. Um, don't use green and blue, or blue is a bad color. It's our ability to distinguish between blue and black is not good, so just don't use blue. But anyway, if you did, um, it would be distinguishable to someone with deuteranopia, but not to someone with tridinopia. These both bend blue and they're the same color. Cyan and magenta is a commonly recommended combination for colorblind accessibility. Um, and you can see that they are distinguishable for both things. They're both forms of colorblindness. And then green and magenta, a lot of microscopists work with green fluorescent protein and they like to only change the color of one channel. And so they'll use green instead of cyan. Um, this is also a fairly good option for colorblind individuals. And just going to show this slide quickly. So I said blue is bad. This is why blue is bad. Um, and this is from our new preprint. So you can see high contrast options are here. And then as you get further down the figure, when you do a grayscale test for visibility, how much information you are, you are losing essentially. Um, and what you see is that when you're using these dark colors on a dark background, it becomes very difficult and you start losing some of the contrast that would be there and you would be able to see if you were using a more helpful or high contrast color combination. Um, so generally it is best to avoid dark colors and especially avoid blue on a black background and stick to higher contrast options whenever you can. Okay, that is the end of my little rant about colorblindness. That's really cool. I think that's so helpful for uh, many people. I am I'm on an equal opportunity board because I'm hard hearing and yesterday I had a conversation with a colleague who is colorblind that we should uh, try to uh, implement uh, standards in our collaborative research center to um, try and tackle this problem that 8% of the male researchers share, as you said. And uh, that really helped me to um, identify like, the problems and the issues and try to um, find strategies together and test for the actual use of the figure. So what is what I didn't get here is, is very this something that is good regarding colorblindness or is it uh, also an sub-optimal 
Calabaria uh, or MEP? No, Viridis is pretty strong for colorblind individuals. Um, and you can, again, you can Google and there are various different color maps that have been optimized for, optimized for colorblind people and you can check. Um, the other thing is annotations. And so this is addressed in our preprint as well and there are figures on it. Um, if you also need to check your annotations on your figures, it's not enough to make sure that your figure itself is colorblind safe. If you have green plants and you start labeling things with red arrows, not helpful. Yeah. Um, and so I, and if it's also like if you have the same symbol, but in different colors, you want to make sure that a colorblind person can distinguish between those or you need to use different symbols. And so there's a whole series of recommendations about um, how often or, or some of the strategies that you can use and how to go through this process of checking your figure to make sure that both the image based figure itself, the image and then the annotations are colorblind safe and visible to lots of people and not just people like you. That's great. So I'm going to post the link to your print, preprint in the document. Any other questions? MP asking a question on the chat. Yeah. Safa? Okay, so I will go ahead. Um, uh, she or he asking about uh, instant microscopy images. That's a green and uh, yeah, like that, like that magenta and green are two colors often on uh, has to use more than that. What what shall they what shall they do in instant microscopy images? Because ma magenta and green are two colors that one has to use often. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so these, this is magenta and green. It does end up being colorblind safe. Um, green is very good in terms of contrast. Magenta on a dark background, not so good in terms of contrast. So I would use green as your primary. Magenta, if you need a secondary and try to put the green in areas where it's gonna be closer to a dark background and the magenta in areas where it's gonna be closer to the green, um, if you can do that. But green and magenta is a solid option. Right. Oh, and okay, and asking about a fourth and fifth color. Um, let me see if I can quickly find. So again, this is also in our preprint, and I don't think I copied the slides in here, but I have them in another presentation that I have. So I'll see if I can quickly find them. Um, In the meantime, we have a question whether inversion of microscopy images would be acceptable for journals and whether it uh, increases uh, contrast or visibility. Yes, it does. It does, and in this, uh, you, your experience would be that journals are accepting that and it would not count as manipulation? Um, I would be clear about the fact that, you, that that's what you did, but my colleague who does a lot of microscopy and image work actively recommends it and included it here on this figure. Um, so this is another figure from our free print. So with two colors, it's reasonably easy to find colors that are colorblind safe if you want to just show the merged image. With three colors, not so much. Um, so there are a variety of options that you can use. The first one is to show the two color um, with colorblind safe colors and then split out the third color and show that separately. Sometimes, depending on your exact image and the co-localization, you can combine two colors with grayscale. In this particular figure, because things are so strongly co-localized, it doesn't work well and I wouldn't recommend it, but sometimes it can work. Um, you can also show your three channels separately next to each other and then show the merge next to it if you want. Um, or you can show the three channels separately in grayscale or in inverted grayscale to increase contrast and make features visible. Okay, that's amazing. I think there are no questions. Uh, thank you so much, yeah. um, Tracy. I think that was uh, uh, gave a lot of opportunity 